Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a goal. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. This week's RTGA podcast is ready to return to play. Okay, welcome along. Um, great to have you with us. Um, we're looking at a football championship. We have a, an idea of what's going to happen in the football championship, what, what shape is going to take. So I'm delighted to say we're joined by Rory O'Neill as always, by Desi Dolan and by Kevin McStay. How are we all doing, lads? Good night, right. Mikey. Good. Right. Um, you probably saw Irish Independent Colin Keyes had a line about um, kind of the, the championship structures and our own Damien Lawler on the RT website today kind of put a bit more flesh on the bones and so we might actually get dates, fixtures, everything on Monday. So things are picking up. Um, before we get into what this might all mean, Rory, I think, as a, the producer of the Sunday game, I think you may have a little bit more insight than some as to what the football championship's going to look like this year. You might just give us a broad outline of it. Yeah, I suppose the first thing to say is that um, the good news is we're going to have a championship. And that's the, that's the big, big, big plus, which, of course, we were all very nervous about that we wouldn't have had um, only a couple of weeks ago. So that's the big thing. But um, sort of broad brushstrokes and to tie back in with Colm Keyes' um, article last Saturday. So, in effect, the championship will return on the 24th of October, but that will be hurling to begin that weekend, as far as I'm aware, football to begin the following weekend. There will be two rounds of the National League. The final two rounds of the National League will be played off to ascertain promotion and relegation in advance of the 2021 season. And um, then you're into a straight knockout competition as per the draw that has already been made back in October. So, no backdoor in football. Um, straight knockout um, there is one round of backdoor which is the, the double jeopardy uh, in hurling and thereby each team will be guaranteed a minimum of three games in football if you include the two league games and two games in hurling and uh, the season will be up and running and run right up from the 24th of October to right and it'll run for eight weeks solid up until the 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 ninth tenth or of or sorry the sixth fifth sixth of December sorry the thirteenth of December with potentially one week's grace depending on should there be any sort of uh, anything unusual happen like you get a draw in an All Ireland final they might need to replay it I'm sure like because uh, it will be all these games are going to be decided winner on the day and it will be um, extra time and penalties which I'm sure Kevin will have something to say about that so that's the kind of a loose plan which we will definitely have um, which we have which we are looking forward to yeah uh, Desi it's it's a, it's going back to the back to the year 2000 isn't it for uh, straight knockout football you were playing back then uh, ni- nice memories or <laughs> a, a, or a brutal and savage way for an inter-county season to be played out after all the commitment etc 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 it's funny it depends on your draw like Westmead have uh, Dublin in well I don't know where it's going to be played but to have Dublin in the first round so they'll obviously be fairly anxious about that I, I, <laughs> anxious, anxious is a nice word. Anxious is a very nice word, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> would, 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 would they be sleeping? Would, would they be getting any sleep days or anything like that? Dublin are showing a little bit of good form at the minute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my first game, my first game was in '99 against Carlo down in Dr. Cullen Park, and I don't know, Kevin, can you remember? But the referee sent off seven players in that match. I do. <laughs> seven. And I was like, is this, is this the way a knockout champion? But like they said, it's going to be a different intensity today. And I was like, what is going on? Everyone's getting sent off. Like, you know. but, um, but like, do you know what? This is the reality of football. Um, sometimes you could be playing Dublin in the first round back then. And lads would be rushing out of the dressing room. He said, where are you off? And he says, I have a flight booked. I'm heading to New York now after the match. Like, because they know in their heart and soul that they were never going to win the, win the match. Now, it's actually interesting this time. A lot of lads don't have the option to go to America. So, like, most teams will have full-strength players. You see the likes of Michael Quinnivan coming back for Tipperary, did his travels coming back. Like, all the county teams are going to have their players back. I think it's really, really exciting. I think the knockout champ. I think it's really exciting for lots of reasons. Obviously, it's been straight knockout. But then, the time of the year it's going to be played, it's going to be novel, it's going to be different. I think people are going to be mad keen to watch the games on TV. Obviously, there's going to be an to go to them. 
But I think it's going to be, it's different for the GA. And I think people want a little bit different in terms of what they're offering is. I'd love to see the games on a Friday night. I'd absolutely love it for players' sake as well. To leave the Sunday free. Friday nights, you could head to town after games. Saturday nights, you know, maybe play it later in the evening, 7 o'clock in the evening, and create a really good atmosphere in towns and venues around the place. But, like, it's definitely knockout. The thing about knockout, there's going to be massive surprises along the way. And I'd say, like, teams will fancy their chances. A one-off match, can you take out a team? And, of course, you can. And I think the motivation for that will be immense with different teams around the country. Yeah. Kevin, do you see Westmead ending Dublin's drive for six then on that first day of the Leinster Championship? Or, well, late into the Leinster Championship? Uh, sorry, Des. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, the, uh, no, I think Dublin will extend. I looked at, looked at the Leinster draw, Mikey, and... Um, you know, I mean, really, they have it. They have it. We are looking at the Leinster draws. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I had a look at it to see just how easy it is for Dublin yeah. to get to the final. And uh, unfortunately, the Leinster Championship has been a been a busted flush for for quite a while. Uh, so there won't be any issue with uh, running that off. And <laughs> they can run that off every three days if they want. So <laughs> nobody, nobody will be given out. But the other three provinces, of course, just to. To move it slightly, slightly on, um, do have very, very interesting uh, early round games, certainly quarterfinals and semifinals, which will make life a bit more difficult for whoever's going to come out of there. And of course, we know the numbers are unequal in all the provinces, and therefore there's going to be more weekends required in um, in Ulster, uh, in particular. Um, but there's tough games: Cork, Kerry, uh, um, Roscommon, Mayo. Then the winners against Galway. You know that won't be simple for whoever comes out. Um, but Leinster, sorry, Des, is uh, yeah. Well, fourteen. I think it's fourteen or fifteen years now. Kevin Dublin have done the business. So. Oh my God! Yeah, just gives you an indication. Uh, do you know what? Like yeah. they like Kildare. They're great. They're great though. Yeah, yeah they they're like the Kildare. Jack O'Connor. <laughs> Me like they've all just they've, a lot of them have given up the ghost to a certain degree. They just yeah. And the problem so here's is the big thing, Des. Yeah. If I, sorry, just to cut across you. In previous years, uh, like the draw for for um, Mead and Kildare, they're on the top part of the draw. They are, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in previous years, this would be very exciting for Mead and Kildare because they're just one game away from Super Eights, but they haven't even got that now. You know, so, <laughs> but conversely uh, to that, Kev, conversely to that, Kev, like, does the, does the straight knockout format offer any solace for the likes of Mead and Kildare? Knowing, I mean, it was part of the sense of fatalism around Dublin. Part was part of that drawn from the fact that even if you did manage to pull off the most unlikeliest of shocks, they'll resurface in the super eights, they'll resurface in the back door, and it was just there there was an added sense of hopelessness to it. Or no, does the I, straight I, I, knockout does the straight <laughs> knockout alter that at all? No, well you just heard Des, you know, <laughs> sorry, it's a nice it's a nice uh, thesis, Rory. As my teacher used to say, you're waffling now, Max. <laughs> um, the, um, the, um, no, he heard Desi's number there for I didn't realise it was fourteen hundred. Well I did if I thought about it, but I don't think about it anymore in Leinster. They they're they're um, they are so the only thing that might give them solace is the big break. And form now, nobody knows who's in form or who's out of form. Uh, and the week on week on week on week nature now of the tournament. Uh, yeah. That might give them a bit of solace, uh, more so than, than, than uh, Dublin re-emerging uh, in a round later like, like it used I, to be, I, if I think, they needed to. I think rather than giving me or kill their hope, it, it quite possibly gives hope to Carlo, Offaly, Wexford or Wicklow that they might get to a Leinster semi-final or God help them a Leinster final on that side of the draw. I think yeah. the you know the lower tier might take out a middle tier, but I, it's very hard yeah. to see Dublin being stopped by anybody in Leinster. Yeah. I go back to Westmead on that because Westmead got to a couple of Leinster finals a few years ago with Tom Cribben, and it was like, oh geez, we're after getting to the final now. We only have Dublin to play, but the problem was the fact that you know that Dublin's coming, and you t- you kind of think, oh, it's a Leinster final; it's going to be a great occasion. But then, when you're playing Dublin, they beat you by twenty five points. There's nothing going. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and everybody, everybody in Leinster yeah. looks at the draw now and goes, "Oh, Dublin are that side." So, like the likes of Kildare and Mead, would be really excited because they think they get to a Leinster final. The only problem is they have to play at Dublin when they do get to the Leinster final. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at it as living, like living uh, live, what does he call it? Uh, um, um, Living, living to die another day. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> that's, if we, uh, that's, that's it, yeah. 
if we look beyond Leinster, I suppose uh, in our emails last night, it's what, what Rory pointed out, that when you look at it nationally, what Galway have to do versus what Monaghan have to do shows yeah. you how completely and utterly inequitable everything is now. Is this, yeah, yeah. yeah I, but Mikey, I, um, I listened to Rory's argument last night for a while. He's very good at arguing when you don't have the page in front of you. He's deadly at it. But when you take out Monaghan, Rory, um, mm. Monaghan's draw is not outrageous. I mean, yeah. they're in the bottom half of Ulster. Look at the top half of Ulster, Tyrone yeah. and uh, Donegal, and Armagh. the winners playing Armagh, most likely. Now, yeah. Like down, down below, um, Monaghan have... Um, Monaghan have Antrim. a simpler, uh, simpler uh, I think they have a uh, Cavan. Cavan, first, they play Antrim, yeah. and then they'll play ah, the winners on, of Fermanagh and down. Yeah, I look uh, not a hill of beans there now. If you're informed, but, 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 you know. But, but I suppose I suppose the point, though, Kev. I mean, look, yeah, if you, I take the point about Monaghan's side of the draw. But I suppose the, the, the more general point is that, and this is something you made mention there of the week on week nature of this and the attritional nature that this may yeah. bring. The yeah. fact that some teams might end up undergoing extra time, extra extra time. There might be penalty suspensions, long run out, suspensions, injuries, soft tissue injuries. You know, yeah. like a lot of people equate this as taking a Rolls Royce out of the garage after four months and expecting it to be bombing up the M50 100 mile an hour, uh, which is the case with a lot of intercounty players. You might necessarily have that level of prep time involved. All of those, all of those factors come into play where you have a province where you have to hit the ground running and play week on week on week. But if you're in, like if you do have Galway, let's say for argument's sake, you know by, by and large you're prepping for a Connacht final right now. Yes, yeah, I accept that. Let's be that. honest. And, and, and Kerry likewise. Admittedly, they, they will definitely see Cork as a potential banana skin, but they'd be expected to get over that one. Again, the same. So the inequities of the provincial championships is going to come back again. And there will probably be people giving out about that, as there always is. But would you guys feel that this was an opportunity lost to maybe try something different? I think, Kev, I think what you're seeing, Rory, is the power of the provincial councils. And any reform that's going to take place has to be done hand in hand with the cooperation of them. But at the same time, they've all, they all kind of look after each other. They're all kind of looking after each other's corner. Like It's like as if, the Leinster Council are very happy doing what they do. This is what they, they've done for years. And the, the change part of it is something that is so slow in the GA. And the Club Players Association are banging the drum about new fixtures and stuff like that. But really, the people, like, I don't really blame so much the, the, the president of the GA or, the, or you know, the, some of the guys up there in Crow Park. Like, they're doing a very good job. But the reality is, on the ground, it's the provincial councils. And you're seeing it now. They're the power brokers in, all the, in the fixture list, really, because they're deciding who, who does what, when fixtures are going to take place. And, and I suppose the distribution of money is a big part of the GEA now to a certain degree, but they're very slow to let go of the power that they have the provincial council. And I certainly do believe that I would have loved to see an open draw, like the possibility of Cork playing Tyrone in the first round. Just open up and have quality matches, pick out the best matches, get them on TV and stuff like that. Because you're still going to have a few games maybe early on that might be the most appetising for the supporters. Mm. And um, what do you think about that, Kev? Was, it, it was obviously it wasn't a runner. Um, we know that from the get-go. It was always going to be the, the provincial championships. But, but do you think, has a trick been missed? Oh, or is, this, yeah. is this just inevitable? We know it's yeah. inevitable. We knew they, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, etc., etc. But it, I, it, I was, think there it was, was a chance to blow everything up for, tw- for 12 Yeah, months. there was. Yeah, and um, a little bit unfortunate because uh, we were so, we are, we have been for many years now married to the October championship draw, the November championship draw, you know. Mm. And once that was made, Mikey, and uh, you're kind of hamstrung because those fixtures were made and they were out there. um, And now to make that draw null and void, to go down a different road, would have taken a fair a fair uh, leap of faith by the four provincial uh, secretaries, the four provincial, pro- the, the four provinces. But I haven't said that. Like it was never not going to happen. Once the draw was made, somewhere or other, these championships, these provincial championships, were going to take place. But I certainly do uh, agree with you, or, or, or what, what you're proposing that it was a trick that was missed. Because in the in the current environment, I have no doubt you could have uh, got any format, and I literally say any format through in the yeah. current format because everybody was just uh, so uh, looking forward to games of any description yeah. that everybody would have parked their their interests, their prejudices, everything, I think just for the three months that were in it mm. uh, and gone with it. 
but perhaps uh, see the GA aren't really at that stage yet. You know, they haven't figured out the geography of the eights and the sixteens and the thirty twos and how that might all be done. Um, and the open draw isn't as appealing now as. Uh, a lot of us might think because there's going to be a lot of dead matches in that open draw unless Rory you said last night something interesting you put 16 seeded teams on well I think that's what you were saying in yeah. one bucket and 16 and you'd have that you would have had that you couldn't have double because you couldn't, yeah, you couldn't, have Curry you couldn't l- l- like let's be honest you could not <laughs> run the risk of Dublin drawing Kerry in the first round yeah, yeah I agree. Like, that would just be you know bonkers yeah. stuff like well, you, know, be you just couldn't yourself. yeah, yeah but know, again so. lads it, it shows you the 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 and, and this is a, the old philosophical debate that we all, that all the top officers say, you know, the club is the heartbeat of the GA and it must come first. And, but of course, the financial driver of the GA is, and the shop window is the inter county game. That's where the millions upon millions of uh, euros are generated that are distributed back. Fantastic model back to the, well, for the most part, fantastic model back, <clears throat> back down into the, into the units. But so, so it is a massive. Uh, financial uh, stream and that's why it had to take place it was always going to take place and uh, the manner in which it's taken place now uh, sticks with the old tried and trusted which is the provincial system even oh, though a lot of us would argue it's 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 kind of a dead duck like there's one there's one perhaps two at most big games in every province out of out of is there 40 games in the provincial championship I don't know is there is there five big games in the whole country that comes out of the provinces but is there? Per, yeah, maybe. But perversely, what we have now, Desi, is that we have a football championship that bar three games is made up entirely of the provincial championships. The GA's baby, the Super 8s, is gone. The the Talton yeah. Cup is, is dead before delivery. And <laughs> we're now going, gone. you know, we're going back. Yeah. And now all the focus is going to be on the provincial championships, which most people agree don't really work particularly well for anyone except the yeah. provincial council there's no, there's no national league final mikey either remember that yeah They're so as well finals. so it's yeah, it's finals, kind of yeah. it's the old tired provincial championships time to shine you know it is <laughs> it is you know what mike it is but you know what people are absolutely crying out for a football match kevin hit the nail on the head there like my dad he's whatever 70 odd years of age but like he would absolutely love to watch a gaelic match on tv now of any description because there is a massive appetite. Now you see the soccer coming back, you'll see the rugby coming back. Like the GA is a big part of Irish culture and Irish life and Irish community. And when you don't have it, it's a big, big miss in everyone's summer. Like, and people are talking about being mad to watch an under 12 game at this stage. Mm-hmm. I would take any sort of a championship, I would take any format. It's just going to be great to see them Rolls Royces, as, as Rory said, coming out of that garage again, because in fairness, it is very exciting, but it, I think it'll give the country a big lift as well to see GA players mm. back out in, mm. out in fields across the country. And I think from, see, a, TV, yeah. and from, a, t- and from a TV perspective, Kev, I think, uh, I think and in terms of the lads, I think from a TV perspective, the one thing I suppose, given the, okay, the provincial championships maybe, maybe haven't the same luster that they may have once have had, but from a TV perspective, there will always be at least two or three games every weekend that will be very, very interesting. I mean, Cork mm. and Kerry meet very early on. Now, while Cork might not necessarily have ambitions to go and win the All-Ireland and might be a bit off that level just as of yet, they would fancy themselves in a one-off game against Kerry. I can, give you, I can guarantee you that, and especially if that match is at home. So, like, that's a major, that, and that, that'll happen early on. Donegal Tyrone is very early doors. Mayo Roscommon is early doors. Um, you mm. should have Kildare and Mead coming in fairly hot and heavy as well at some point if they manage to negotiate the earlier rounds in Leinster. Yeah. So, like, you yeah. will, like, the, the provincial finals, I think, are the ones that, uh, like, you, well, Mayo Galway will obviously save that if they won't manage to make it. But I'd, I'd be a small bit worried about the provincial finals. You know, the yeah. showpiece events for these competitions, that they could be blowouts, you know? Well, I, 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 if I can come across you there, Rory, to, to talk about the competitive side of it. You know, so, so, so you're right. Some of those provincial finals, the Connacht final will be fine because it'll be Mayo or Roscommon most likely against Galway. Uh, and nobody would say how any of those three teams, which one of them would be guaranteed to win it. You couldn't say at this stage. The Ulster final will be fine. The Leinster won't be. And it's unlikely, unlikely the Munster would be. The, you know, their final is the semi-final. Let's, I know this is not nice to say, but, you know, Bar Tipperary uh, come with a, a big run or something. I, I don't know. Um, but 
th this is where th this is where it's all going to get a bit messy. Is the overlap in September with the club game and the intercounty prep? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if we knew, and this, I said this to Joanne last week in a discussion, if we knew, if the GA had done the ballsy thing that they should have done and issued uh, absolute uh, sanction and rule about uh, breaking breaking the um, return of the intercounty groups, okay, like the best they could do was suspend the insurance fund. Now that's that, that doesn't heed no, nobody no, nobody. Well, I won't say nobody, but a lot of a lot of teams will see it worth the risk to, to having a go to having a go at that. If we knew that all teams were going back on the first of October, you would have a level playing field in terms of prep because. Uh, some teams will not come out, lads, as Rolls Royces, because their county chairman and boards will insist there is no county prep until the championship is over. Some counties will do that. I, I'm going to unfortunately say the so-called smaller stroke, weaker counties will do that. The big counties will sort things out to themselves and look at the club formats. You've been looking at them, some finals in August, for God's sake, and you have to the 17th of October, technically, well, the week before that, to finish it. And some counties have scheduled it for, I saw one, the 23rd of August was one of the finals, in the name of God. So that's a blitz they're running. That's not a championship. Uh, so this is the point I'm making. If it was a level playing field, lads, and the gate didn't open until the first week in October, that the county manager had his players back, now, you, now you're really moving towards a level playing field. Now you have eight teams that say, gets five, six weeks of form, they can win the All-Ireland. Mm. Yeah. Now I go along with Kevin there because I'm hearing rumours already about county managers and I'm hearing like an awful lot of club teams are back training and yeah. they're defying the rules but they're back training like and they're just willing Mr. to take Desi, risk. Desi, I was down on the beach here in Donabate uh, two nights ago and yeah. there, was, uh, there was two teams training down there. Now they weren't my yeah. club. They were, but right, they were, just, 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 I just want to put that on the record. They weren't my, no, they weren't my club. They, were, yeah. <laughs> they were, it wasn't my club, but there was two teams there training. It was a yeah, Ireland team. Well, like Kevin's in the nail on the head because basically what's going to happen, and I remember this myself. Remember November, December were uh, banned from training the county animals. teams. And everyone was like, oh, geez, that's great. Now the players are going to get a rest. And we ended up playing Division 1 the following uh, February. And Paul Beelan came in as manager. But we, we actually, we, we just followed the rules. And maybe it was because financially, maybe Westmead didn't want us training, whatever the case may be. But geez, were we lamp chops when we came out and played in February because everybody else had done their work, has been doing something, like not officially, but certainly unofficially, the county teams were full tilt. And the, 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 the facts of the matter are, when you do take a pitch, and you don't have to work done. You look fairly sheepishly now or silly when it goes to play a match. So I, I do think like that is a big, big problem that Kevin has come across that needs to be addressed because I would say that it's the county manager that gets most access to the player is the yeah. county manager that's going to reap the benefits in a couple of weeks I, after that. Well, well, I, sorry, Mikey. Uh, go on, yeah, go on, go on, Mikey. Yeah, no, please. no, I was just going to say that I didn't really want to get too much into this Cub v County debate. Myself and Rory were chatting about it because... It, it, it tires me out, to be honest with you, because nothing's really going to change. But secondly, yeah. what, uh, and I do want to put this to you as a question, because I don't want to say it as a statement as an RT uh, journalist and etc. bias, but I think there's a flaw in the Club Players Association kind of, uh, uh, kind of mandate and their campaign here. And I think it's a simple flaw, and I'll put it to you as a question. The problem is that fans want to see Intercounty back more than anybody and club players for the most part are fans of their county and I often think that there's a quid pro quo here and most club players you tell me if I'm wrong they don't really mind that much that their county their, their county teammates disappearing for large parts of the week or missing training as long as they're at their matches and they want to see their county do well am I being naive in saying that because I, I think the building block here is the club player and I actually don't know how exercised the club player is by losing their county players to train and join the week. Yeah. Well, uh, Des mentioned uh, that the counties would have uh, all their stars this year because there's no US travel. Well, mm. you know, I, I can assure you, you know, having some knowledge of the local scene here, uh, that's the exact same for the clubs. You know, there's no, no lads. So the clubs are very strong yeah. this year. But leave this year in particular just, just to one side, Mikey. The... Uh, your your premise is correct. I think you're right. You have, you have a sense of how the club player thinks, but unfortunately, uh, 
they've they've ripped it to bits. They, they've mm. taken huge advantage of of the club players' decency and the approach he takes to it. As in, they really are finding it impossible to know what their schedule is. It has been essentially ripped up, and that's been going on now for some number of years. So a lot of players uh, have become disillusioned with it, and they go off. You know, they're, they're, our club now essentially does a bit in April, stops then until August, and, that, and in between the lads up to now, everyone goes off to America or does whatever they want to do. You, you're trying to prepare a team in terms of physically peak them uh, for August, September. It's nearly impossible at club level. Uh, and all you're getting are the crumbs all the time. And that's what's brought it to a head. But unfortunately, and I, I leave it at this because I'm like you, Mike, I'm fed up talking about club stuff now and CPAs. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the absence of sanction, the GA Paddy doesn't understand that he's play, that he's a member of the association. He he only understands he's a member of a club. He doesn't see the big picture. Crow Park or Crow de Lachy goes up there somewhere. So they do what they want. And you're seeing even at, at county board level now, you're seeing counties do whatever suits them. And they won't be guided by Crow Park in the absence of sanction. Mm. No, that has been, you know, it's like the old, I, I keep saying, it's like the road traffic uh, laws we have. We have the most fantastic laws in this country, but half them aren't applied. And that's yeah. the same. We don't have sanction. And the GA issued these new good guidelines, uh, and the best they could do was suspend the, the, the insurance fund. So I, like, I'm like you, I'm blown up with this club. Put it in the rule book. Just, yeah. just one, one before, because before, I'm just conscious on time as well. What do we think of Christmas All Ireland's? Oh, geez, I think it'd be unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, Under yeah. lights on a Saturday night, does he, huh? Yeah, no, and mm. Dublin would be hopping that night. <laughs> but I remember, <laughs> I remember we, played, we played the Leinster Club final against St. Bridges in Dublin. Oh, it was 2011 or 12, but um, it was Christmas week we played. It was the 18th of December on a Sunday, I think, we played. And I, it was the best Christmas I say I ever had in my life because you'd all Christmas the basket, you were finished your all the football. It was coming into the party time of the year. Now I don't know how much party we've done this Christmas, but certainly the mood will be incredible. And can you imagine Christmas week, the build up to an All Ireland final? Like I, I do think it's going to be really exciting all this championship because it's so novel and so unique. And at the end of the day, when it comes down to the business end of it, the teams and the players, the fitness levels, the organization, everything about the GA will be very impressive, no matter what, because when you get to Crow Park, all Ireland semis and finals, it always is massive occasions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we are, all, we are all looking forward. We're even looking forward to, there's a cabinet meeting today, and all GA folk are excited about that because they'll find out whether they <laughs> go back contact training on the 29th of June or whether they'll just have to stand on the opposite side of the field from each other. Lads, mad to get out shouldering each other. So um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. And... Um, I will be back in a moment with the next one of our coaching chats, which is with Athena O'Connor and Dr. Kieran Austin looking at the coaching of female athletes. Oh, holy Moses! Okay, for the last couple of weeks, we have been featuring some coaches and experts from the GA webinar series, which has been ongoing during the pandemic and has been getting wonderful views. Um, lots of coaches thirsty and eager to get back coaching. And um, they've been getting some advice on a range of topics from a range of experts. And I'm delighted today to say I'm joined by Clean O'Connor and Dr. Kira Lossi. And we're going to talk about coaching the female athlete. How are you doing this morning? Hi, good morning. Great, how are you? Good, thanks. So, Clina is a coach of the Dublin Senior Hurlers and a former Dublin Senior Footballer herself. And Kira is a lecturer in Applied Sport and Exercise Psychology in WIT. So, I am amongst people who are far more capable to talk about this than me. I have two small girls, but at this stage, I put a hurl in their hand and let them, you know, run around and use it as a walking stick. And I consider that I'm doing a wonderful job, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, when, this, when this range of talks was suggested to me by um, Peter Horgan in Crow Park, he said, he gave me the list of topics and I was a little bit, I kind of noticed this one and said, should we really be doing a webinar, especially on, female athletes because that does that not almost in, suggest that the other topics are not for women and of course Peter said that's not the case and but I just like if you could both just explain to me why it is important that the GAA feature seminars or webinars you know that talk directly about coaching the female athlete I, I might go to you first Kira. Yeah I think um, 
there are subtle differences in coaching males and females and females generally research has shown that may have different drives and motivations in comparison to to males i suppose it's a little bit different to what sports psychology is and different from a coaching perspective from a sports psychology perspective i'm dealing with the actual person first the athlete second and then the issues really that they bring to the table as a coach you're really trying to find what drives and what motivates the players that you're actually working with and you could have 10 different players and 10 different motives and reasons and drives for being there um, and the, the coach's job is to kind of tap into what what is that drive and what is that motivation and kind of bespoke the message to that actual person a sports eye can really help to maybe shortcut that process and do some of the groundwork to actually kind of dig deeper into the layers and find out what are their actual, actual motivations. But yeah, two females and males may have different motivations, different drives. Females sometimes also um, unprioritize collaboration, maybe over competition. But that's, I suppose these are kind of, I, I'm just a little bit aware of overgeneralizing these things, not to say that some females can't be incredibly competitive then either. Um, females do also prioritize relationship making and fixing and sometimes over again uh, maybe males are a little bit their, their drive is, is different around that they don't feel they have to have that relationship that connection to their actual teammates but all players have hopes have fears have dreams and really it's the coach's job to, to tap into tap into those okay uh would you go along with that Kalina? that um yeah collaboration can can come ahead of competition and you know, drive and motivation, these things, can, can there be challenges to a coach? You know, you work with men and women, can you, can there be, can that make it more challenging to, to set goals, etc. with a team, a team of women? Is that a fair thing to say? It, it probably doesn't make it, it probably doesn't matter in terms of goal setting. I think maybe the, from your original question, there's, there's two key points to be made, um, in my opinion. The the, the GAA's webinars and all their coach education material have been really well received um, by every coach. Um, and I delivered a workshop on coaching the, or a webinar on coaching the female athlete for the GAA previously. And I said afterwards, it got a great response and every, everything was great about it. And uh, I said afterwards, you know, let's to the LGFA and the Camogie side of the house, let's make sure we, our contribution isn't always about the female athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, like Galway, Galway ladies footballers are renowned for their sort of forward attacking play. Why can't their manager and coaches uh, talk about building a strong attacking team? Mm -hmm. So um, historically, maybe over the last 10 years or so, um, often when ladies football camogie are invited to to contribute to a a wider coaching network or or resource, it's often around the female athlete. And I think that a shift is starting to happen in that in terms of making the the content a bit more gender neutral i suppose and so so that's an important point on on general coach Mm. education i think um and the other bit is and kira makes a great point that whether you're a sports psych or a coach in general like people say you know coaching is about coaching people so we should be always just okay who's this person in front of me and then deal with that but i think that what i've seen and and i've coached all four codes in ga um I've seen that sometimes coaches are standing in a dressing room and they miss the little nuances of, of a team of uh, female players rather than a team of male players. Um, just because maybe through general so- socialization, there's girls of your, I'm thinking of teenage girls, they've slightly different rules for a group of 20 or a group of 30. Think of a schoolyard. Think of, you know, boys will be rolling around battering each other and you, you won't see that with girls or, and that's a really good uh, point, you know, cares about relationship making and fixing. Um, I've seen coaches be like, you know, they need to call each other out. They need to, you know, they need to take responsibility. But for, if you're, if you're a 17 year old girl in a group of 20 players, it's really hard to be the one that, that first calls somebody out because you, you, your relationship making and fixing is important. So there's a fear factor. Okay, if I tell her she she missed the cone or she's not trying hard enough on the way home for training, you know they're going to be to- they're going to be talking about me and I'm oh my god did you hear what Kleena said at training? So that that's 
so I think coaches just have to be aware of the nuances of groups, especially if we're talking, especially about team sports, because mm. it could be slightly different social rules, I think, yeah. for, for females. Is that, Kira, just to, well, not digress, sorry, but it raises an interesting point that the kind of the, the, the awkward teenage years or, you know, the adolescence, puberty, et cetera, you know, because we all see that the numbers, there's the sheer volume of young people, boys, girls, up to the age of 12, 13, who are playing GAA or whatever sport, it's, um, it's 50-50 at least, or if not, you know, slanted more towards the young girls, like the numbers are phenomenal and there's no getting away from the drop-off. And the drop-off for men is probably college age when they move away from home or they discover that they like socializing more than they like getting up and playing a match at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning speaking from personal experience here or uh you know but with women or girls is that drop off is that is it younger and is it as much to do with what clean is talking about there as anything social or um any other kind of anything that pulling them away from sport is it as much that kind of the the that what what clean is talking about there the kind of the the psychology of team sport and how maybe it it rubs up against the kind of the socialization of teenage girls yeah i think it's, it's a dropout is a really complex issue it's a we, we could have a whole session mm. on, on on that separately as it is probably young uh, girls generally have i suppose the socialization their role models are, are different they have when you, you're in that transition period from primary to secondary school at 13 14 years of age you've other competing interests as well and again, maybe as a, as, a, as a society, we kind of prioritize maybe academics for females sometimes and say, well, let the, let the boys run the, you know, run the energy off them down the field and we, we let them play sport and kind of guide, the, guide, the, guide uh, girls towards more uh, what, we've, what we deem sometimes as socially appropriate activities. Um, it's just a really complex, complex issue. What I do notice, though, from my applied work is that if I'm in a senior team or with a senior club team, my range of ages with a female team will be, I could have the superstar who's 16, um, who's maybe, you know, on the panel for the county team. And then I could have someone who's like 35, 40, you know, has a couple of kids at home, managing a home and just the range and spread of age. So really, again, like, like my original point, the drives and motivations, the picture of success is very different for somebody if you're in your late thirties and you're finishing your career, you know, ready to transition or retire, whereas if you're starting your career, whereas in male team, male teams, you don't see that age spread because you have a larger group to generally pick from. You have a lot bigger numbers, whereas females, you don't have bigger numbers because you have that particular drop, drop off. So that cohesion can be different and females can be maybe a little bit more clicky at times because you'll have the younger ones that stick together the kind of the ones that are in college are, are kind of chatting and, and hanging out together and the older females are again another group and um, mm. not always but that does that does happen it's not as that isn't as dominant um within male male teams because the pot is is, is just different the, the, the actual dynamics the demographic is different in in the actual male team so that's something to consider and that's different and that again like i said the picture of success is very different to, for somebody who's 16 compared to someone who's in, in their late thirties and finishing up playing. Yeah, that's that is interesting. It is something you always notice that the like the insane spread of age in a, in a women's uh, GA team, uh, ladies football and camogie is often seen. Kina, is that in the, where we are at the moment in terms of teams coming back from a very very long layoff? Where you know, and it's interesting you mentioned that you've got your sixteen year old who you're probably not too worried about her fitness levels because she's sixteen. And you've got your your 35, 36 year old mother of two who's probably not been getting out and doing too much exercise. So that's probably is a challenge for a coach of any club or county team kind of coming back in the next couple of weeks that they are going to have maybe more so than a, an elite men or even an elite women's team. They're going to have a, a, a very wide range of fitness levels coming back to training, aren't they? It's going to be very challenging, I think, for, for club teams, especially because I think most club teams will have. Um, disseminated some sort of in information or training plan or whatever but like anything um, you're going to have the 10 players who stuck to it rigidly and did loads of work and, and, and their lifestyle allowed them to do a lot of training so they're going to come back in decent physical shape you're going to have players who didn't get anything done 
for maybe they didn't buy in maybe they weren't able to maybe they had three kids at home and they had enough to be doing rather than going out and doing 100 meter runs or whatever so there could be a massive disparity in what the coach is presented with um after the the 29th isn't it when the the ga mm-hmm. clubs open um so the the problem with that is and it, it comes back to the same issue so i was thinking about what's the difference between now and coming back off a of a regular off season so in regular off season, you're still met with players at different levels of fitness. But the problem is now is our championships or whatever are much, much closer. So we don't, we're not getting that nice lead in time where we've got a few weeks to play with. So the challenge is going to be for club coaches and for any coach really, but especially club coaches, um, because maybe the, the, the difference is going to be broader. The spectrum will be wider. We'll be, I suppose, to be a little bit understanding with people. Mm. that the last couple of months have been absolutely crazy you know and we've all dealt with them in different ways and I don't think anyone should be made feel feel bad or like they've let anyone down because they're not quite as fit as they should be you know are we've all been dying to get the GA clubs open and coach again and get people together and I think we should really keep that front and center that this year is not like any other year that we're going to play in GAA sport. It's just not, it's not our prep. Like I'm looking after the physical preparation of teams and I'm trying to decide, okay, what do they need to do? What can I do? And I keep having to remind myself, I, I'm not going to be able to operate in the same manner. It's, it's, it is actually impossible. Um, and even from a training perspective, the logistics of setting in a training session are going to be different. So we have to do the best we can and we have to be as inclusive as possible. We're talking about dropout. So, we're if if people have been absent from our GA clubs and teams for the last couple of months, just getting them back in the habit of showing up at the right time every week and and um, being a team again is going to be very very important. There are there'll be what what have they missed most? So they they're more likely to be doing three k, five k, maybe ten k runs, that type of thing, um, going for cycles. So what the one that the thing they that the most important that they haven't done is, is skills, is ball skills with, mm-hmm. with somebody else probably. So designing a session where they get an unbelievable amount of touches of the ball is going to be really, really important. We're playing at, at GA or, or sports that have a high skill demand. So getting that back together is going to be the most important thing. Um, mm-hmm. But it is going to be challenging, but we definitely all have to remember that it's, it's not the same this year is different and we need to approach it with a different lens i think yeah Kira, is there is there is it possible that uh, a women's team would adapt better to this situation than a men's team kind of you, you talk about kind of the value of collaboration and is there a chance a women's team could be better at the, the phrase making do kind of sounds bad but as we say like it's not the same as any other you you probably won't be able to have the same you hit the same standards, have the same levels that you would hope to have going into your championships. So is there a chance that that kind of ability to look around at their teammates and kind of support them? In your experience, can women be better at that than men? I, I'm not sure if it's a, a male-female thing, mm. but I think it's a little bit like, Jerry was talking about this in the webinar last night, it's a little bit like preparing for, like a soccer team actually kind of preparing for going to a World Cup where we have a really short leading time and space where we have to really problem solve very, very quickly. Mm. So it can allow us to actually get things done very quickly in a short space of time in a very proactive manner because we don't have time and we don't have space to kind of think and lead in and like you, like Kina was saying, kind of play around with things and work up, work up the things. So it can enforce in a positive way, quick problem solving skills, whether you're, whether you're, male or female I just think it's it's a good time now probably to say to coaches that using these lead-in weeks is really important to start engaging with your players with your teams and this enforced break may mean actual retirement for some players as well so they need maybe a bit of support around that transition for themselves or will they be able to come back as it's going to be a shorter season and um, some players will have some genuine fears about coming back. We're coming back in, in a pandemic. We don't know whether they have underlying health issues, people in their family have, or they could be just someone who didn't thrive in this time off and are unfit and really don't want to come back. You know, we, we, there's a range, a spectrum of emotions there. 
So using this leading time, I think, is really important now to engage with your players and really encourage them to be their own case managers and say, well, what, what do you need over these couple of weeks that you can work on at home? We're getting ready. We're in the, I would call it nearly like the a traffic light. We're in the, I would say we're in amber. We're getting ready. We're not green to go, but we're getting ready. Mm. Do you need some psych support? Do you need some nutrition? Do you need to work s and Do you need programs at home? Do you need, you know, can you do wall ball exit? What do you need right now? So encourage them to reflect and think of what they need to ask for it. Or again, once you reach out and make that connection with your players, they will tell you what they need. But again, encouraging them to engage in any of the sports sciences, whether you're junior club, senior club, you're a senior player, there will be sports in your actual club. So use and engage with what's available. Yeah. What are you hearing from, from your players at the moment, Clean, in terms of what they've been doing and what they, what they want to do when they get back? And have they had, they had any requests, kind of like Kira's talking about there, things that you can help them with? before they get back on the field? Um, most players have been, have been active. I mean, the weather's been so good, so most people have been out and about. Um, the, biggest, the biggest thing that they're missing is, is playing, is playing the game. You know, they're, we're dealing with... Um, so in the, in the G8, we're playing a, a field sport, 15-on-15 field sport. You know, we're, we're not talking about people who are uh, in marathon runners, endurance runners. So they've been doing a lot of solo... Uh, activity mm -hmm. and th there's a reason why they're team sport players because they like that environment and they want to do it and they find it hard a lot of them have found it hard training on their own they're like oh my god this, I didn't realize how much the group dragged me along you know and mm -hmm. um, so they they really really just want to get back with the team and play the sport all they want to do is play games um, and even because some of them are asking me yeah, and we go back and it'll be no contact and, and we, we still won't be able to actually play a game of football or actually play a game of hurling. Um, so it just reminds us as well as, you know, myself and Kira are in the, like the support realm and supporting teams and, and all the sports sciences. But at the end of the day, people sign up to play the game, the sport. And we, we talk and, and, and you have to put all the supports in place and we can focus. And for me, you can focus on the physical running and run 100 metres, 120 metres or 2K or whatever. But really, the players sign up to play the sport. And that's what they're really looking forward to is just getting out and playing and, and meeting people. And there are a few that are, um, that are a little bit cautious. Um, but maybe there are people at home or even just they haven't really been out in a group in months so that that weird first oh what will it be like or they went to the shop and now that it was like whoa I went to Dunn's and that was a bit strange I was surrounded by people so it can be it can be just a little odd for people and we have to have a bit of compassion around that I think because everybody has dealt with this differently or it has affected people differently some people didn't affect them at all other yeah. people big challenges you know yeah is there specific pitfalls um, or warning signs shall we call it here that that coaches of, of of women's teams should be looking out for when their players come back in terms of you know like just coping with the with the new reality and cope you know it could be almost a culture shock shock being back around you know so many of your friends all at once your <laughs> teammates and people may not enjoy the the solo sports but it's kind of been what they've been used to for three months of them, yeah. yeah it's for a quarter of a year this has been their reality and now they're coming back um like are, are there things coaches should should be wary of or things they should or shouldn't do just to make sure that everybody feels comfortable back in a in a group you know a, a group setting yeah I, I clean actually nailed it um there are there are three general responses to kind of adversity and anxious type situations we have some people who will absolutely have thrived in the lockdown they love it you know they absolutely don't mind the the, the isolation and um, probably a little bit of an introvert find, motivate themselves, work away on their own. Most of us are probably kind of sitting in the anxiety type box. We're a little bit worried about the future, what shape it's going to take. Um, everyday worries, but maybe feel a little bit more magnified than normal. And most of us are in that kind of area. And then you look people that this will have been an actual traumatic experience for. And maybe they didn't experience death or illness, but they do not cope well being separated from their teammates, from their family members. It's just not a kind of a, a, a conducive environment to their mental health and well-being. So it's really targeting that group of people. So really connecting to your players and having conversations, just connecting and having conversations and having chats with them. 
uh, socially distant conversations, phone phone calls, and just really asking players, how are you doing? How have you, how have you been keeping? Yeah. You know, deal with the person first and the player second. And then you'll get you'll get you'll get what they what you need from once you have that one to one conversation. Most of us are in that middle group, really kind of target the people who are struggling, struggling, trying to try and identify them as soon as possible. And again, using this lead in time to try and identify them. Yeah. Um, coming back more generally to the issue of, of coaching of coaching women, I'm uh Kalina, I just I'd be interested to see what you've observed from playing and coaching about you know what what makes is there something specific that makes a a good coach of a women's team because we've seen great examples of, of mostly men but not exclusively you've got the likes of Van Downey and then you've got JJ Doyle Mick Bowen who've kind of you know managed across uh, two codes three codes whatever in um in men's and women's I was just wondering is do you ever notice any kind of coaching traits that you think makes someone particularly a good coach or manager of a women's team is there something is there anything that like Coaches that you know the lower level, underage or club can can glean from looking at the the top managers in the in the women's codes. That's a good question. Um, I think I think communication is the key. I'm thinking of all the really good um, managers and coaches that I've met that of coaching female female teams, um, and they all have an ability to really connect with the group and to communicate really well and to, I suppose, understand the group, number one. Number two, I think they all set quite high standards and have high expectations. So there's never a sense of, I'm going to lower my expectations or treat you any different because you're a female team. We're, we're still gonna aim, talking about the elite level, we're still aiming up here and I still expect you to be up here. But the, the missing piece then is, is the communication of that message and giving players the confidence to go after it. That's the piece, I think, where people... It's very easy to set high lofty goals or high standards, but it's bringing people from here up to those is, is the bit that, that some coaches fall down on. Um, I, I've been in dress rooms loads of times or talking to managers and they're saying, like, physicality is, is an interesting one for me. That, you know, why won't you go for the ball? And... And the language we use around that and, and, you know, send her into next week and get out there. And so it's, it's all this sort of aggressive, combative language and, and, you know, basically push her out of the way and go for the ball type thing, which, you know, you have to do in a certain mm. uh, um, context or whatever. But I just find that often that goes down like a lead balloon with female teams, um, especially at club level, because... There's something around that, and I'd, and, and I'd like to hear Kira's opinion, but there's something around the physicality of it. Um, I find that you, at, at teenagers and younger kids, um, younger girls, for me, coaching GA, I find I need to set up drills that actually give them confidence and practice with physicality. Because, as I said, like lads will, you do any sort of kind of wrestling game or anything with, with boys and they, they love it, they're like little little you know lion cubs they're rolling around and that they, they really take to that type of uh, activity where girls you know they'll be and i'm talking younger girls now younger teenagers they'd be sort of laughing and oh sorry sorry i bumped into you there um because maybe they just don't do that as much in natural play so i set up drills where the the, the thing is just the ball is coming to me and someone has to come from behind and get in and steal it so there's a bit of physical contact and you get used to oh, just getting in there and stealing it in front of somebody Often when I start that, it's, it's quite difficult uh, or, or players find that quite difficult. But over time then, oh, okay, I, I get it now. But it's just giving confidence on the pitch. And that is, that is the bit, I think, where often people, especially if they've coached male teams and then they're coming and coaching female teams, that transition um, can be difficult because the language you need to use is slightly different maybe or the, the most effective language can be slightly different. And it's not that those girls or female athletes are in any way less competitive. They are still competitive sports people, but how to draw, them, draw it out of them can be slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, and the best managers are the ones that can communicate it in a, in a way that engages the group and gives them confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I have a small theory, and it's, I, I don't know if it's absolute waffle or not, but we something... Love here, yeah, lovely. <laughs> I'll, I'll continue waffling. <laughs> But, but something around that, that idea of 
we were talking about teenage rock and in GAA, so, so teen sports, so Gaelic football, camogie. And is there something around, as it gets more serious and we're kind of pushing the team, okay, we're under 14, under 15, under 16 now, as the physicality of it goes up, mm-hmm. do, some, do some players go, oh, well, well, this is getting a little bit more physical and, and I, I'm not good at that, so therefore team sports isn't for me. And, and it's that little bit that, that I see players sometimes backing away from, and they're competitive and they're really good, mm-hmm. but when it, turns, when it turns the corner into that environment, it's sort of, oh, actually, I, I'm, 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 I'm not good at this. Not, I don't like it, it's, I'm not good at it. Um, and I think maybe there's something around the communication of that as a coach. Um, and just giving players confidence uh, mm-hmm. is, is the key thing. I've, I've totally waffled now. Kira, jump in and say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love what you were saying about setting the bar high mm-hmm. for females, not kind of lowering the bar. Like the bar is there, not to limbo wonder. That's what we always say, it's to, to get over, to go over. So I love that idea. But I, what I would see with really good coaches would, are able to instill the belief. So you set the bar, but they instill the belief that I know you can do this. Now, you may need support to do this, or you may, may need certain targets, certain areas that are your strengths and target certain areas that we need to work on. But they instill the belief that the actual player is able to get to that bar and then provide the supports for them to. That's what I see the actual, and that's the, the, the art of coaching. Um, and for me, that's the, I, I, like I, I see it, it's, it's qualitative, it's not quantitative. I, I don't have a number, I don't have a formula, I don't have a theory, but you'll see it in action in the, in the, the, really, good, the really good coaches that the coaching is on top and the sports science and the numbers and stuff is on top. Just, that's just there to support the message that they give to the actual players to get to that bar, to push, to help instill the beliefs, but it's evidence-based talking. It's evidence-based. In, so they're using the, the science to actually support your statements and instill that confidence because you can hit them back with numbers. You can hit them back with evidence, that, that, that type of thing. So I love that you said that. That's... that's um, be a pet hate of mine would be to oh sure like lower the bar it's a girl you know it's like no push them I push them further push them higher if they, if, if they can do it i'd love to see that that's a, that's a nice research piece maybe about the physicality yeah yeah, yeah. i don't know it's just as especially <laughs> coaching teenagers i'm like mm, yeah there's something yeah. in us i think i'm not sure you're giving me ideas here yeah. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad we could help. Um, Thanks, it's, it's been productive and um, we might leave it in a minute, but I think it would be good if there could be coaches who are going back to a field now in a couple of weeks who are probably starting off their coaching journeys. Maybe they're taking their, their daughter's team because, you know, they were, you know, foolishly turned up at a meeting and, you know, didn't opt out quick enough because this is how most people's coaching careers start, I think, at club <laughs> level. Or maybe they've, they've been coaching a men's or a boys' team for years and they're now going to be starting coaching a women's team. I'm sure there's hundreds of these people out there because that's what grassroots coaching is. Usually you take your kid's team or you, you take the team that nobody else will take because, you know, you're a member of the club and you want to, whatever. But um, I suppose if you could both maybe just give us a pla- either a practical tip or something that they that these coaches should keep in mind that that would be helpful. Um, might go to you first, Kira. Is there yeah, just anything simple, at all, really? You know, yeah, simple messages like who or what actually who inspires your players. Finding finding out those simple simple ideas, using them. What hopes and fears do they have now about transitioning to play, and how how can you actually support them? And mm-hmm. um, and particularly for the younger players, you've seen that fun, 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 and uh, you know in, introducing. Like Lena was saying, the physicality in a very fun, fun way. Okay. And yourself, Lena? I think for me, the, there's, I think you've got to make sure, especially in the first couple of weeks, regardless of what age groups, it might be more important for older players who are more aware of some stuff. Not necessarily, though, but that, they're, that the environment is safe, that, they're, that the training session, don't take any shortcuts on the two-meter rule or, or any of that logistics because you want players leaving that going, Okay, that was grand. Yeah, we, we, yeah, I felt I was happy out in, in that space. Um, and the other bit is we always say in coaching, load the touches of the ball and do it in small groups so you get more touches. Now we're being forced to do that. So, so in a way, actually, we could be, do unbelievable coaching. So I would say those first couple of weeks, especially when there's no contact, don't think, oh, my God, there's nothing we can do. There is so much stuff we can do, absolutely so much stuff. And be creative and... 
with, especially with the skills, really watch the skills. Really, this is a time you can really coach kick passing, striking off the left and right. You can give players exceptional feedback. You know, Mary, the first week we came back now, you couldn't punt kick off your left. Two weeks later, look at you, you're pinging it there 20 metres to her. That is fantastic. So there you're saying, I know that you can kick off your left. You're setting the bar high that you're going to use both feet. You've shown that you're watching your player because you're shown, I know that you couldn't do it now you can. And you're showing them that they've improved. So as a player, there's nothing better than getting specific feedback from a coach and knowing that I couldn't do that. I practiced and now I can do it. Oh my God, I'm getting better. So I think coaches can really go after that sort of attentive coaching on skills and, and really solid player feedback, which will be good. Everyone will love it. Yeah, that's good. And I'm glad both of you, you didn't go back yeah. specifically with, 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 with what you, the advice you gave works for both genders. And as I said at the top, I think that's kind of, and how you, you seem to both agree that that's kind of how we should be looking at this is that, you know, this is sport for all. And while there are obviously differences between the genders and we're not pretending there aren't, for the most part, you're just dealing with athletes, team sports people who want to play their sport. And um, I think that's the most important thing to bear in mind, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, Kalina and Kira, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both this morning. And um, for those of you who are interested in hearing more from the likes of Kalina, Kira, and the GA's host of uh, coaching experts, um, you can find out more about the series of webinars on the GAA website. And um, now, so that's it for this week's RTGA podcast. Um, don't forget Saturday and Sunday Sport are back this week on Radio 1. And we have the Sunday game on Sunday night. If you don't subscribe to the podcast, please do. We're, we're, we're here every week. We're doing our best. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, maybe rate us, comment on us, say something nice, which is unusual for YouTube, but you can always give it a go. And we will see you all again next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy balls!